So this is the first of two tutorials that we uh, prerequisites to a bare minimum um, at the risk of some of it being very elementary, uh, but hopefully there'll be enough to not so not elementary, but not too complicated mathematically. And please stop me at any stage to ask questions, given that I'm allowed two 45-minute sessions. Uh, I have plenty of time to answer questions. I don't want to lose the audience. Um, and uh, as I said, I don't I, I don't know what sort of backgrounds to expect, so I'm going to build this from, from, from scratch. Uh, so let me let me start with three of my mathematical heroes, uh, who will meet the, the, the first two will meet during the uh, during the course of the lecture. Sophus Lee, who was the who was the uh, mathematician who came up with the concept of the Lee group or continuous symmetry group and was very interested in using them for solving differential equations. Uh, Elie Carton, the great, great French differential geometer, of the first half of the 20th century, uh, uh, notoriously brilliant, but also notoriously difficult to understand. And a good fraction of my career has been spent trying to understand what Carton wrote. And then the last gentleman is my thesis advisor, Garrett Burkow, here at Harvard. Uh, I did my thesis at 19. Seventy-six. I was Garrett's last mathematics PhD student. He had to learn applied mathematics, and Garrett played a role in the. He wrote a, a, a kind of idiosyncratic book on fluid mechanics, in which he said the Lie groups were also important in mechanics and classical mechanics, not just quantum mechanics. And uh, I think he viewed me as a means of catching up on what had happened in the period from the early fifties when he wrote the book until when I did my. PhD, and that's where I learned about these groups, and it's set me on the path that I'm still going on. Um, so let's start with the first topic, symmetry. So I'm just going to show some slides, because there's an there's a interesting question to me. So these are, these are some uh, African masks. Of course, there's patterns and symmetry, and certainly bilateral symmetry, but there's other types of symmetry going on in those patterns. Uh, these, I believe, are from Papua New Guinea. Um, here's a Chinese... Uh, Paper cut. This is an amazing art technique where they. This is one sheet of paper that they cut out to make these incredible patterns. Uh, I, I put this in because one of my Chinese visitors recently gave me one of these on my wall. Uh, this one I believe is from the Alhambra. Uh, here's an even more spectacular one from Esfahan in Iran. And so, so here's my question, and I have no idea what. Is this has even been studied? Humans, it's clear from all cultures, are very attuned to the notion of symmetry, but why? I could understand from an evolutionary perspective why we're attuned to bilateral symmetry, but why these sort of patterns seem to, uh, and other things show up all over the place. So, so I'm just going to throw that out. I don't have any answers. I don't know if anyone has looked into this. But that's, so that's, that's my first question for, for the audience. All right, so I, being a mathematician, I'm going to tackle this from a mathematical point of view, or tackle symmetry, not this cognitive questions. And so it was recognized that symmetry leads to the notion of groups or group theory. That in order to understand symmetry, we have to understand the mathematical notion of a group. So let me begin by introducing uh, groups to those, to those who may not know what they are. Uh, but let me, I like this quote from a Russian mathematician. So next to the concept of function, which is the most important concept pervading the whole of mathematics, the concept of a group is the greatest significance in the various branches of mathematics and its applications. So if you don't know group theory, you should know something about it. So, uh, so I thought I'd throw in a little bit of history. Uh, by the way, when do I go till? 12.05 uh, or okay. 10. Okay. We'll just cut off whenever we reach so, so the history of group theory 
comes with the problem of solving polynomial equations. So, in fact, the, the history of solving polynomial equations really has to do with explaining symmetries of the roots of polynomials. So as you know, the quadratic formula goes way back to Greeks, to Indians, to, uh, uh, well, they said, it says the Arabs, but actually Al-Kharazmi was uh, Persian and so on. So all of this in building up to our well-known quadratic formula. And then in the 1500s, there was kind of a, a, a competition among Italian mathematicians of solving first the cubic and the quartic polynomials, degree three and degree four. So there are these very complicated formulas that they came up with. And then, of course, they got stuck when they tried to do degree five. And starting with Lagrange, who was really the mathematician who introduced the notion of a group, and the groups in question were the permutations among the roots of the polynomials, the symmetries of the roots. And this led, of course, to the famous result, uh, initially not quite proved by Ruffini and then proved rigorously by Abel, uh, another Norwegian mathematician, that sold, said that one cannot solve the quintic polynomial using algebraic operations of taking roots and fractions and so on. And then, of course, this led to Galois and Galois theory on which polynomials can you solve, and that has to do with something known as the Galois group. And then Sophus Lee comes into the picture. Sophus Lee was interested in solving differential equations, as I mentioned, and he knew about Galois' work, and he wanted to do for differential equations what Galois had did for poly done for polynomial equations. So that's how he was led to invent the notion of a continuous symmetry group. Now, actually, what we did wasn't the Galois theory of differential equation. That's something that started with Picard and Vessio and led to the field of differential algebra. I'm not going to go into this. But anyway, Lee did both finite dimensional Lee groups and infinite dimensional, what we now call pseudo groups. I will not attempt to do the infinite dimensional case here. Um, but you may say, so, so what is symmetry? Let me, let me show you why symmetry comes into the quadratic formula, if you haven't seen this before. So there's the one we, we learn in uh, junior high, I guess. Um, and let me just write those two parts of it as u plus or minus v. So if you graph solving a quadratic equation is, of course, the same as uh, uh, finding where the parabola given by ax squared plus bx plus c intersects the axis, and u is the symmetry axis, the, the coordinate x equals u is where the axis of symmetry is, and v and minus v, this plus or minus, are exactly the distance of the roots from the symmetry. So there's kind of an intuitive notion of why symmetry is important even for solving something as simple as a quadratic equation. Okay, so what is a group? So it's a, bi it's a set with a binary operation, associativity, identity, and inverse. And the key fact is that groups are not necessarily commutative. So, so one learns to do this. And you already know, even if you haven't studied group theory, you already know lots of groups. You learned this in elementary school. The integer is under addition. The identity, of course, is 0. And the inverse is just the negative of the number. One can go to the rational numbers. Uh, you could do the positive rational numbers with a different group operation. Instead of addition, you could use multiplication. Now the identity is 1 instead of 0. So the identity depends on what sort of operations you're doing. And of course, the real numbers, as we learn uh, in uh, wherever we learn them nowadays in school. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then, of course, things get more interesting when you go to groups of matrices. So the first really interesting non commutative group is the group of non singular 2 by 2 matrices. And there's this very weird formula you learn in linear algebra for how you multiply two matrices. It's not entry-wise multiplication, it's this operation, but, which, of course, you know is much more important when, from the mathematical point of view, for solving linear equations and so on. And the important thing is G times H is not the same as H times G. The identity matrix has this form, and then there's a formula for the index. Okay, so, so far, so good. Now, let's connect this up with symmetry. So we'll call a symmetry of a geometric object an invertible transformation that preserves it. So you have some geometric object, and you look for a transformation that doesn't change it. That's, that's what I'm going to take as my initial definition of symmetry. And it's pretty clear that the set of symmetries forms a group. So this is the connection, and this is why group theory is underlies symmetry. Uh, so the operation, the group operation is just composition. You first do, so we do it in this order, we first do H and then we do G when we multiply them. 
So for instance, if it was a linear transformation given by a two by two matrix, that's exactly the operation of matrix multiplication. Um, the composition of two symmetries is clearly a symmetry according to this somewhat vague definition. The identity, meaning you do nothing, is always a symmetry. So every object at least has one symmetry, namely the identity. And of course, the inverse of a symmetry, if you undo the symmetry, is a symmetry. Because if you go from S to G times S, and then you go backwards, you still have the same. OK, so, so that's, and oh, this slide is just occasionally I'll use the notation G sub S for the symmetry group of the set S. OK, so here's the audience participation part of the talk. Uh, what are the symmetries of a square? Okay. So we have, of course, rota uh, rotations by, by, of course, and the identity. Don't forget the identity. <laughs> so that's that's a, that's already a group, a group of rotations, something called Z4. Now, one could have more other, what about, are there other types of symmetry you see? Mirror, mirror. Yeah, so there's reflections as well. So one could have mirror image. So there are also four reflections. So that's a bit larger symmetry. I'll show you some more symmetries in a second. Okay. And of course, these type of symmetries, and including translational symmetries, underlie this classification of wallpaper patterns. So maybe you've seen this, that there are 17 different types of wallpaper patterns. They're all represented in the Alhambra, if you know where to look for them. I think a couple of them you can't see in person, because they don't let you into that part of the Alhambra. But when my wife, who's also a mathematician, takes students there, one of their big projects is to find as many of these symmetry <laughs> patterns as you can at the Alhambra. Activity. Oh, this is an Alhambra one, too. This is a bit more complicated one. Uh, this is one from Esfahan. So these are all different tilings. And of course, symmetries underlies the, the subject of crystallography. So for crystals, there are actually 230 different types of symmetry groups. And I don't know offhand that all 230 are found in nature. All right. Other types of symmetries, you've probably seen fractals, like the top snowflake. So this is the one where you start with a triangle, you divide each edge, and you add a, an extra triangle bit to each edge, and then you repeat infinitely often, and you get something that approximately looks like this. And here, the symmetries, well, of course, there's a rotational symmetry, a threefold rotational symmetry, uh, but there's also a scaling symmetry. So in particular, if I looked at this part, it looks exactly the same as this part. So there's an example of scaling symmetry. Okay, there's an actual snowflake for your reference. Mm -hmm. Here's kind of a, another one. I, I like, well, I like your own particularly because my wife is from Iran. So I tend to, if you ever get a chance to visit Esfahan, it's absolutely amazing. Um, this is another pattern which has scaling symmetry. Uh, this is something you may be familiar with, the, the artwork of uh, Escher. So this is something he called circle limit four. So it's angels and devils. And there's certainly some sort of symmetry, but this is a bit more different. This is something known as a conformal symmetry group. So the mappings of the circle that take, say, one angel to another smaller angel come from the, the conformal symmetries in hyperbolic geometry of the circle. And Escher, being very attuned to the mathematics, took the mathematics and used it to design these artworks. Um, conformal, by the way, means preserving angles. So it certainly doesn't preserve distances or size, but it, it does preserve angles. Um, okay, so now, as I mentioned, Sophus Lee and most of my work has to do not so much with discrete symmetries, but continuous symmetries. So now, continuous symmetry groups, what are the symmetries of a circle? Well, of course, now we can rotate by any amount. Okay, so we have the symmetries depending on a parameter the parameter being the angle of rotation. Of course, you could add in reflections. Um, but there's actually more than this. If you learn uh, complex analysis, you learn that there are conformal inversions that take the inside of the circle to the outside, uh, so-called conformal maps, uh, that preserve the circle. So one can have also conformal inversions, which are much less obvious. So there may be symmetries around that are different from what you might intuitively expect to see. And uh, oh, here's Sophus Lee again. Continuous symmetry groups are known as Lee groups in honor of Sophus Lee. Uh, not lie groups. I was once asked at a party <laughs> if I worked on groups of people who lie to each other. <laughs> That's a different topic. <laughs> um, but so, if, but if you realize with the circle, you can do a continuous 
rotation, you could actually do the same thing with a square. So, so if we take a square and blow it up like a balloon to make a circle, so there's a continuous map from the square to the circle, then we can rotate the circle and then we can go the reverse map back to a square. So there are weirder continuous symmetries of a square that are not so intuitively obvious. When I asked you that original question, I bet you nobody thought of this as an example of a symmetry. But, it, but it's there, at least mathematically. And it says that in order, this original definition of symmetry is a little bit flawed, because I probably want to exclude this type of symmetry, but if I allow arbitrary transformations, these creep in. So one needs to be a bit more careful. And so to formally define the notion of symmetries, you have to a priori specify the allowable transformations. So do I allow only rigid motions? Do I allow reflections? Do I want to include those as one of my symmetries or not? Do I want to allow conformal maps if I'm going to do the circle with a conformal map? Or do I want to allow arbitrary continuous or arbitrary differentiable maps? And then I get these uh, uh, non-intuitive symmetries of the square. So, so to, to do this properly, one has to start with a transformation group. And I'll go through a little bit later all kinds of transformation groups that you might be interested in. These are the allowable transformations of the ambient space, M. So M could be a manifold, but for this purpose, it's just Euclidean space. Yeah. Are the transformations more than the previous slide for, uh, for the square? So for the square, if this G is the set of all continuous maps, yes, then they're allowed. However, if G is what's called the Euclidean group of only rigid motions, then no, they're not allowed because it's not a rigid motion. And it's not a conformal map. If G were the set of conformal maps, then that was the allowable notion. So one has to, before you even define the notion of symmetry, you have to specify what are the allowable transformations. What are you willing to permit? I mean, you could even go beyond continuous and allow completely discontinuous functions, but then almost anything is a symmetry. Uh, well, you can start to Okay, so once we specify G, then the symmetry of the subset is an allowable transformation of preserves, okay? So to add, ask the question initially, I have to first tell you what are you allowed to do, and then I can, then I can formally ask the question. It makes sense mathematically. Okay, so let's, let's do some more interactive. This is, this is my bathroom tiling. So what are the allowable transformations? I'm going to allow rigid motions. So by rigid motion, I mean translation, rotation. Here, I'm not going to allow reflections, but I could allow them if you wanted to. But let's just do translations and rotation. So what do we have? So for the symmetries here, what we can translate in one direction, we can translate horizontally, we can translate vertically. We could all even translate as a diagonal if we first translate it horizontally and then vertically by amount. And of course there are rotations, there are 90 degree rotations that we had before just for the single square, right? Everybody agree? So in this case, these are the allowable transformations, the rigid motion, this is just mathematical. And these are, this is the symmetry group of this bathroom tile translations and rotations through 90 degrees. Okay, everybody accept that? Yes. Okay, well I wasn't telling you the truth. <laughs> this is my actual bathroom. <laughs> well, it's not really my bathroom. Let's pretend it is my bathroom. Maybe the hotel's bathroom. Okay, and it's not an infinite tiling of space. I, there are no infinite bathrooms in the world, as I checked. Um, and so if you try applying any of those symmetries before, you, you, you fall short. So if you translate, this edge of the, of the bathroom is going to go off the edge. So just translating that is not a symmetry. Rotating it, and I made it so the two arms are of different sizes, so you can't even reflex it. So you can't rotate it, you can't reflect it without destroying the bathroom. So if you have a finite bathroom tiling, or if you're at the Alhambra, of course, none of those tilings in the Alhambra or in Esfahan are infinite in extent. One has the problem that what we call symmetries, what we intuitively uh, think of as symmetries, are not actually symmetries. So from the point, from the definition that I gave back here, a transforma allowable transformation of preserve the subset, there are no symmetries of this. But to our, to our eye, there are certainly still symmetries. It's still a square tiling. We see these. And so what we're seeing 
is something that I'll call a local symmetry. So if I looked at just a small part of the bathroom, then I see a symmetry. But if I look at it globally, I don't see a symmetry. So there is a mathematical framework for doing this, and it's something that I resisted for many years, but have now grown to light. Uh, it's something, so let's first say, a local symmetry of a subset, <coughs> so think of the bathroom, tiling, based at a point in the tiling, if there is an open neighborhood such that G takes that open neighborhood to an open neighborhood of the same shape. So if we go back here, if I say, took this point and drew a little bit around it, then I can map that bit to somewhere over here, right, without, without with them being exactly the same. But if I took this point and moved it somewhere over here, then it's not a symmetry because it's off the edge of the map. So this is the notion of a local symmetry as opposed to a global symmetry. And this is something I've become uh, quite interested in just recently. And the mathematical framework underlying this is something that's known as a groupoid. As you probably, even if you met, you probably did not meet groupoids. Now, what is a groupoid? Let me try to explain what a group weight is. Um, for those who like category theory, here's, here, here's a, a classical mathematical definition, small category of every morphism. If you know what category theory is, you know what a group weight is now. But of course, I'm not expecting anyone here, including myself, knows category theory. Um, so let me uh, skip that. A group, the best way to think of a group weight is it's like a group, except you're not allowed to multiply all the time. So the best way to think of it is a groupoid is like a collection of arrows. So each arrow represents a symmetry, okay? And there, each arrow comes with what's called in groupoid language a source, which is where it starts, and a target, which is where it ends. And so if you want to multiply two groupoid elements, you can only do that if the target of H, in other words, where H ends up, is the source or the start of G. So you can multiply these two, and you get, you get an arrow like this as the product. But if G started at a completely different point, you're not allowed to multiply. So if we want to go back to the bathroom and the symmetry is here. So suppose H was a symmetry, a local symmetry that started here and mapped this point to here. So that's the source and that's the target. And then G is a local symmetry that mapped this part to this part. Then you're allowed to multiply them and you still get a local symmetry. Yeah. So the elements of the groupoid only have local actions. So That's right. Yeah. You, want to, you can think of it that way. They only have local actions. So they're only defined in the neighborhood of a point. So then can I think of uh, a bunch of pairs of groups and elements on which they act? So it's each element and, and right. the whole group. So, so maybe the best way to think of a group is it's a groupoid in which the source, in which there's only one point, all the sources and targets start the same. This could represent the entire space. So they all start on the entire space, they end up on the entire space. So you can always multiply, no matter what. Whereas with a groupoid with these little local symmetries, you're only allowed to multiply them if you go from A to B, and then you go from B to C, not from some totally different point D. So I can't think of the groupoid like in, like if I think of a manifold, I think of the tangent space, and you mean tangent spaces. So here I can't think of the groupoid as a tangent space. Um, one good example of a groupoid, which may be what you're thinking of, is the is the composition of Taylor polynomials. So if you have a Taylor polynomial, it's based at a point, and it goes to another point, so from source to target. There's an algebraic formula for composing two Taylor polynomials that only works if the source and the target of the composition match up. So if you think of H as a Taylor polynomial based at a point Z, and G as a Taylor polynomial based at a point W, you can compose G and H as long as H takes you from Z to W. You can write out the formulas if you do the compatibility condition. Uh, Something close to what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so there are many overlap. examples of, of groupoids coming up in all of all kinds when of areas of mathematics. The chart, when you're given the chart. Yeah. So they originally arose, in fact, in number theory. Then, uh, then they arose in trying to understand these infinite dimensional groups. But they're now all over the place. Poisson geometry, Hamiltonian systems is another good source of groupoids. I don't want to get too much into groupoids. 
A, I think it's the right language, but on the other hand, B, I don't have what I would call the killer app that says that this is really what we have to do to understand it. But it's certainly the right language for understanding local symmetry, and I think based on things like tilings and so on, uh, it, is, it is what we need to understand when we're talking about symmetry. Yeah. It's, that's a nitpicky question. I was just wondering why it's called local symmetry. So, because I mean, the like kind of the symmetry part goes away other than on the formal definition. So it's the kind of local similarity, if you will, right? So yeah, maybe similarity. Yeah, I, 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 I like the term local symmetry, so that's why I wrote that. That's basically my definition. It's motivated by some image processing things that will be related to stuff coming up later. Um, I think it's, oh, yeah, so so let's go back to the square, and let's ask, what is the symmetry groupoid of a square? And I'm going to only allow rigid motion, so this is my notation for rigid motion. So translations, rotations is all I allow. So if you think of this, at the corner, where can you map a corner? So you take a little neighborhood of the corner, you get a small piece of a corner, you can map that, of course, there's always the identity, it doesn't matter where you are but you can map that to any other corner. So the corners, the symmetry groupoid is just the fourfold rotations that we have naturally embedded. <coughs> but if we started at a point on an edge, then we can slide that along, and we, so if you think of it just a small part of the edge, that looks like this small part. So there is a symmetry, a continuous set of symmetries of the edge, symmetry groupoid, but you can't slide it along too far, you go off the edge, you go out here. So you're only allowed to slide it along so far. Or you could map it to part of this edge, or part of this edge, or part of this edge. So there's a much richer structure in the symmetry groupoid, even when I only allow rigid motion in the, in the, in the symmetry. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. I'll say one of the big quest, open questions a little bit later, but there's a lot of work to be done in trying to understand how this works. These are not the type of groupoids people in mathematics tend to look at. They like things called lead group points, and these are not necessarily lead group points. Um, oh, another area where there is some work, but not a lot yet, is, say, crystallography, going back to that. Uh, if you have a crystal with variable structure, so you see here there's different types of symmetry structure, but they're kind of all put together. So again, there aren't global symmetries, but there are all these local symmetries in the crystal. But, so I think it's also the right language for understanding. That's all I'm going to say about group voids. What about dislocations in crystals? Yes. You know, the ones that have a significant change in the symmetry, and then they can move. Right, right. Are they group voids? Well, one could, one could try to understand that in the language of group voids, yes. Yeah, so that's kind of the thing, things like dislocations, or there's a lot of work going on, in, particularly in Minnesota, on uh, materials with multiple phases that coexist together, where the symmetry of each phase is different. One is, say, tetragonal, and the other is cubic, and they're up, right up next to each other. And how, how do you make them compatible? And it seems like there's also a, a, a group weight element. As I said, I don't have the application where you really need to understand group weights to, 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 do it, to get a good theorem, but I think it's the right framework to do this. Yeah. How does locality, how can we think of locality with something like a fractal where locality might be a little ambiguous? Well, locality, so to my point of view, it's just a, na a neighborhood. So I'm not assigning any special size to how small is small. So the neighborhood for a fractal, of course, you can take arbitrarily small neighborhoods and you blow them up. And they look still the same. The scaling self similar. Yeah. So from that point of view, any neighborhood. Even for the square, you could take arbitrarily small neighborhoods of your, your point at the edge and move it along. Okay, so I think I want to move on. So let's let's talk now into the symmetry. Remember, to understand symmetry, one had to understand what type of transformations allow. So let me say something about uh, transformation groups. And so first, by starting by introducing the main types, which we've already seen a bunch of them. So of course, there are translations. <coughs> Rotations, so those are the rigid motions. Um, uh, rotations are commutative in two dimensions, but they're non-commutative in three dimensions. I like when I talk to popular audiences, 
do the experiment of taking a book and rotating it in two different ways in one order and then the other order and it comes out different. Non-community of 3D rotations. Uh, reflections that we already met up with. So this is not orientation preserving. You might want to look at that. Similarity group, which we met with the fractals. Uh, and then, more generally, one gets into projective transformations and what are called equi-affine transformations. So an affine transformation is just something of the form AZ plus B. A is a matrix, say two by two. And equi-affine says that it preserves area or volume. Um, so projective transformations are what come up if we start looking at, say, 2D objects at an angle. So that's what this is supposed to represent. So here's a 2D object, except now I've tilted it, so I'm looking at an angle. So there's a whole field in, in image processing and visual processing and computer uh, design about how do you reconstruct a 3D object from its 2D projections and so on, structure for motion and so on. Um, we, our visual system incorporates projective or at least approximations to projective transformations. So if if I ask you or I ask somebody who doesn't think about it much, what's the shape of, of your coffee cup? The answer is clearly it's a circle, right? But of course, this is not a circle. The projection of the coffee cup onto your retina is not a circle. It's more like an ellipse. And so the projective and the equiaffine transformations are the ones that say, well, I know this is a circle, but I'm also looking at an angle. So an ellipse at an angle is a circle to our, to our visual processing system. So somewhere in there, there's some sort of projective, the fact that we're representing a 3D world by 2D projections onto our retina means that somehow built into our visual system, and I guess visual systems of animals as well, you know how primitive you have to get to is allowed is that the circles are, are ellipses when they're projected. And of course, understanding this led to the uh, sort of uh, renaissance in art of learning projective transformations. Uh, before that, if you look certainly at Western art, they were very poor at doing perspective. You see these images of people in the foreground and people in the background all of the same size. And then they realized that that doesn't work. It has to be in perspective. And this is, this is a, a, a print from Albrecht of using basically some uh, tools to, to figure this out. So not doing it intuitively, but doing it rigorously. So here's the loop, and I guess he's drawing a picture of the loop by following these lines and figuring out where to draw the various parts of the loop, and thereby learning projective geometry. Okay, and there's a simple camera. So this is, this is a big area, and in fact, this goes back to a very famous uh, lecture, uh, inaugural lecture by Felix Klein, who was a contemporary of Sophus Lee and a very good friend of Lee, and led to what's called the Erlanger program. This was the title of the lecture. But each type of geometry is founded on a corresponding transformation. In other words, geometry is the same as group theory. So, for instance, Euclidean geometry that we learned in high school is really the geometry based on the what's called the Euclidean group rigid motions, translations and rotations, or you could have, well this is not in the, the fancy contemporary sense of mirror geometry, this is just uh, geometry including reflections, or similarity geometry, remember you do triangles and you have all these different things for similar triangles when you learn them in high school, I think they still teach that. Too. Um, so now the group includes not just the rigid motions, but also the scaling. There's also a projective geometry, and in fact, every time you have a transformation, you have a corresponding geometry. Okay? So now I'm, I'm getting towards the sort of things that I'm working on, and the basic question I'm going to ask is the equivalence problem. When are two shapes related by a group transformation? So when I see that copy cup, yeah. So just a simple question. So on the previous slide, it's, it's not just that group, it's also the set. So. Right. Yeah, so there's a space on which the group acts. It's not the group by itself. The group acts on a space. And one could take that as the definition of the allowable transformations. Those are the geometric transformations. So if you do Euclidean geometry, you're only allowed to do rigid motions. So if you're constructing things like compass and ruler, then you do Euclidean geometry. If you do similarity geometry, say the geometry of when we used to have uh, overhead projectors and things you zoom in and zoom out, 
then we allow scalings and we lose the notion of distance because distance is not preserved when there's scalings. And eventually I'll get probably the way things are going tomorrow to the invariance associated with all these geometries. Okay, and similarly for projective geometry, I'll show you. Are you going to include topological geometry? I don't work on that, no. So I'm not going to include in this lecture, but one could very easily do topological where where the donut and the coffee cup are, are the same. Yes. When you went to the circle, when you went from the square to the circle. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a topological. topological. Yeah, that was getting into I just topological. Wanted to yeah, change. exactly. Yeah. So I don't person because I'm I'm more a differential geometer, I don't do so much topo topology. Okay. <coughs> So there's different types of equivalents. So one first specifies the geometry or equivalently the group acting on the space, and then you ask for what, when things are equivalent by the transformation. So are they rigidly equivalent? Are they projectively equivalent or equiaffine equivalent? So here's a two tennis rackets, and one might ask, are they the same? So they're certainly not rigidly the same. So if the question was asked in Euclidean geometry of the, of the projections, the answer is no, but projectively they're the same. There's also a symmetry, of course. Here there's a Euclidean symmetry, which is fairly easily detected. Here's a much more challenging projective symmetry. Okay, so there's the question of equivalence and symmetry. Okay, but so things so far things are looking great. Uh, but there's a very famous result. <laughs> so question, are ducks equivalent to rabbits? Well, there's a paper by a, a Swedish uh, I guess he's more an engineer than mathematician. Ustrom, I think is how you pronounce his name, in 1995, that told you how you change a duck into a rabbit using a projective transformation. Okay, so here, here's your duck. And what basically, these are all projective transformations. So they go through a series up to here, and then they come up to here and end up with a rabbit. So basically what, what he's doing is he's taking that duck image and moving it very close to your eye, and it looks basically circular, with a little bit of noise here. There's the remnants of the duck. All the duck is in this tiny bit of noise. But what you didn't see in this picture was there's also a tiny bit of noise down here, which is basically the rabbit. So when you tilt it the other way, the rabbit pops up, and the duck is somewhere. Who knows where the duck is going? But somewhere on the edge of the rabbit. So if you take symmetries or transformations too far, you can end up with results that are based, so basically everything is projectively equivalent if you allow a little bit of noise. So that's not good. Well, you say, well, maybe projective group is not, not what I should really be doing. I should be, be a bit more limited than that. Uh, oh, that's, that's another. Oh, oh this, I, this I got when I was taking one of, one of my granddaughters to the museum in London, Victoria and Albert. They've got the resistor, but there are other ways to change ducks at the rabbits. Um, but there's this famous illusion, uh, I don't know, has everyone seen this, the Thatcher illusion? No. So you take your, your least favorite politician, of which there are many examples nowadays for both, both ends of the spectrum, but in, in, when it first came out, it was Margaret Thatcher, so this was early 80s. So this is what you do, or if you're a least favorite researcher, maybe, <laughs> competitor. Um, you take a, a, a regular portrait photo, Margaret Thatcher, and you rotate it by 180 degrees, and then you use Photoshop to cut out the eyes and the mouth and rotate each of those by 180 degrees. And it's starting to look a tiny bit odd, but not too bad, right? Okay, but then you take this portrait, this one with the rotated eyes and mouth, and rotate it that by 180 degrees, oh. and you get something looking like this. Um, so somehow our visual processing system is saying, okay, I'm allowing rigid motions, but don't take it too far. Don't, don't do very big rotations, or I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not willing to process that. And I'll, I'll take this as very bizarre, whereas each of these, even the rotated one, is looking halfway reasonable. So somehow our, we're attuning, of course, to where the eyes are, where the mouth is. And so on. we allow certain configurations, but not any old configuration, even though it's rigidly equivalent at least on a local scale, which is equivalent. And I think, so this is more speculation, but this is also related to the question of groupoids, that sort of local transformations rather than global transformations are what one should really be concentrating on. And the big question I don't know, 
is what is the right notion of an invariant that would encode this? So maybe there's some sort of probabilistic notion that assigns a probability to how far you're allowed to transform something before your visual system or the animal's visual system, whatever it is. No, wait a minute, this is not the same, even though, even though it's uh, formally the same. But I don't know the right mathematical notion of invariant that captures this. All, those, all of the sort of obvious ones just reproduce global invariance, and they wouldn't would not capture such a thing. So this is kind of a question. I don't know that the mathematical solution is what you want to look for in this particular case. I mean, this this has been used as sort of an illustration of the notion that the brain has specialized procedures yeah, for yeah. perceiving upright I faces. I agree. Right? Yeah. So, so it's just that the upside down and upright faces are being handled by different perceptual yeah. systems, and they're sensitive to different things. No, I agree, but yeah. but. I mean, I would also like to do the duck and rabbit thing from the same perspective, where it's now, now it's no longer your brain. Your brain is obviously not saying, your brain is not very good at these equiaffine or projective transformations of recognizing when two things are equivalent, even when they're not too far different. But certainly your brain is nowhere going to say that this is the same as this because I've been projective manipulated. But some notion of invariant that allows you to go a little way, so this one, this is starting to get to the limit where you say this is like a duck, but one can still pick out some features and notice it. Where by the time you get here, it's it's gone too far. So that's why I think of some sort of probabilistic or measure theoretic notion of how far it's allowed. For your yeah. Yeah. So, so as I said, this is something I'm thinking about actively. I do not have a good solution yet to what the right notion of invariant. What is the right mathematical framework to ask even ask these questions? All right, how am I doing time-wise, please? Five minutes, ten, three, five, ten minutes, ten minutes. Okay, okay. So one of the things I have been very interested in, and I'll show you results of this tomorrow, is the problem of reassembling broken objects, which started with work on uh, jigsaw puzzles. So here again, this local global comes into play. So if we want to assemble a jigsaw puzzle, so, so the puzzles to me, by the way, don't have any pictures on them. So I'm purely going to do this on the basis of shape. One could, of course, say, well, of course, we really use pictures when we're doing a jigsaw puzzle. But I'll give you some examples in a bit to show you that there are even some interesting puzzles out there where you can't use picture forms. So if you're going to do, do shape, of course, you don't want global equivalence, because, of course, this piece and this piece are not globally equivalent. They're very different shapes. One has two indents, the other, the other only has one. But of course, what we really want to do is recognize that this part of this piece matches this part of that piece, and then of course you can put them together. So there's a local equivalence of the puzzle pieces. And that's the sort of thing that I like to, like to concentrate on a bit. Um, uh, and this gets into, uh, I was talking with a few of you uh, right before everything started about the problem of occlusion. So this is also the occlusion problem. So our brain is quite good at if we see a part of an object of reconstructing, if we know the object is from a certain class of objects, of reconstructing what the rest of the object looks like. And so one can take this local equivalence problem as also the problem of, under, of, of recognizing objects up to occlusions as well as the equivalence of parts of the pieces. So the same techniques I'll talk about tomorrow will, will also have a role to play in that. Um, and solving the equivalence problem we're nice knowing something about invariance. So I guess I have enough time to at least start on invariance, and then we'll do the, the more important stuff next time. OK, so let me talk a little bit about invariance. So an invariant is just a quantity that's unchanged by the group transformations. So you have a group acting on a space. That's your geometry. So it could be rigid motions. It could be projective transformations. It could be similarity. What are the invariants associated with that? And we'll meet various types of invariants. Today, I'll just do the simplest ones. And then it was recognized quite a long time ago, maybe even back in the days of Galois, that if two shapes are equivalent, they must have the same invariance. So that doesn't guarantee they're equivalent if you need enough invariance. But at least if you measure invariance of two different shapes and they're different, you know those shapes can't be equivalent. Okay, so that's, that's the notion of invariant. Uh, so this is the formal definition. We have a group acting on a space M, an invariant. I'm just going to take real-valued invariance as a real-valued function that does not change under the action of 
I of G times Z is I of Z. So this is this is classical in, in all of mathematics. This is where I get stuck with the groupoids and this local notion of symmetries. What is the right definition for you? That's what I'm, I've been searching for for some time, and I still don't have a good answer. For it. Okay, so for today, let's just do something that I that I like to call joint invariance. So these are these are more algebraic than the differential invariants I'll introduce uh, tomorrow. So a joint invariant is an invariant that depends on several points in the space. And you already know some of these. So for instance, if we're doing rigid motions, Euclidean geometry, then the simplest joint invariant is the distance between two points. Because if I rigidly move both the points the same way, I don't change the distance. So Euclidean geometry is the geometry of distance. Okay? And what about Similarity geometry, when you do similar triangles, you no longer have a notion of distance, so you're allowed to zoom in and zoom out, but you do have, you still have invariants, they're just a little bit more complicated, so the ratio of two distances is an invariant. Oh, let me, sorry, let me back up for one second. Not only is this the most obvious invariant, basically all invariants are at this point. Every invariant of a set of points in Euclidean geometry is a function of the distances. So you take any function of distance, it's still invariant, and that's a complete set of invariants. That's a very classical result. And similarly for here, the ratios of distances are a complete set of invariants. Also, the angles are invariant, but there are formulas for angles in terms of ratio of distances, basically. Uh, law goes like that. So angles and ratios of distances are the basic invariants of similarity geometry. Um, for area-preserving affine geometry, the basic joint invariant is area. It preserves area. So now you need three points in order to define a joint invariant. And the area of the triangle of those uh, described by those three points is an invariant. And again, this is a complete list of all the invariants. Every invariant in equi-affine geometry is, is a ratio, is, is a distance. Now the one you probably don't know is what are the, which I didn't know when I, when I first derived this, I had to go, it turned out it was in the literature, but I had to search for a while, is what is the basic joint invariant of a projective group? So if we're doing ducks to rabbits, what are the invariants of that? Well, it turns out, if you learn complex analysis, you probably saw something called the cross ratio. So this is the two-dimensional version of the cross. The cross ratio is the one-dimensional, even though you're working in a complex plane, it's a one-dimensional complex thing. This is the two-dimensional version of the cross ratio. So you need five points, and if they're in this configuration, there are four areas, and you take the product of these two areas divided by the product of those two areas, and that's invariant under general projective transformations. Not only that, but all the projective invariants are functions of this. Yes? What would happen with a periodic crystal? Where you sort of have... Oh, like the Penrose tile. Exactly. Yeah, this is... I don't know. I, I don't know what the right, right. I know there are ways of looking at the Penrose tiling as a projection of a regular uh, tiling up in a higher dimensional space. Uh, but how that interacts with the what invariants group or groupoid theory or what the invariants are, I don't know. I've never I've never worked on aperiodic tilings. I tend to work mostly in continuous symmetry more than discrete. All right, I think I've basically reached the end. Yeah, let me, so rather than go on longer, let's let's pick up here, pick up here with where I left off. Yeah. So, I mean, this is kind of a broader question, but since you've got the cross ratio up on the slide, yeah. you know, there was a whole uh, movement in visual perception in the 1960s, and kind of ended in the 1970s, to try to figure out if the human visual system is sensitive to the cross ratio, because the idea was, because it's an invariant of shape under projective geometry, yeah. Then by this sort of argument to uh, to analogy to perception you were making earlier, that people ought to be very sensitive to it, and it basically didn't work. Um, not only are people not particularly sensitive to it, but it's it's not it's not really a coherent basis for an entire visual representation of shape. Mm -hmm. Once you take into account all the more specific kind of um, prop, you know uh, geometric shape properties or various kinds of uh, other kinds of inference that the system is trying to make. So um, that, that turned out to be kind of a dead end of perception. I, I'm just picking up on the next question before. I, I, I'm not sure that trying to find a, a, you know, a, a, a very clean notion of mathematical variance 
is is that productive for, for perception? I mean, it's the beginnings of a, of a huge project, but um, there's a lot of disanalogies that are, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen with examples where you where you subject a shape to not not too wild a projective transformation, and your visual system does not does not recognize that at all. Yeah, so certainly there's some notion of projective. The coffee cup is 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 certainly an example where it is sensitive to the projections of something, but it's it seems to be very limited. Not knowing the experiments, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean that's it. But that really... reconfirms my suspicion. From the, just looking at it myself and see what I can recognize. And... Well, I'll just follow up on the coffee cup. Then I don't want to monopolize the time, but but like as you said, people see an elliptical shape at the top of the coffee cup as a circle because they understand the projection. But you know, they, there are also many ellipses that we see in real visual stimuli oh, yeah. not perceived as circles because the projection of the ellipse is also an ellipse. It is also an ellipse. So, exactly. so that doesn't it doesn't solve the problem. No, the, no. There's some there's some there's some priors here. The fact that when we see a cup, we rarely see an elliptical cup. If, right. we, if we drank from a lot of elliptical cups, we probably wouldn't see that. Per, as a right. Precisely. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> no? Any other questions? Well, let's thank Peter for the first part. <laughs>